everybody. Um, this uh, would be a very informal uh, session meant uh, to be a discussion uh, session. We will be some presentation, <coughs> but mainly this would should be one of the first so a sort of kickoff meeting uh, of a hopefully a series of uh, scientific discussion on, on Nobel gas in the framework of the ING. Um, the intention of this meeting uh, uh, started after the last working group B, where um, um, there was a sort of request of, um, due to the new um, generation of Nobel gas, especially new technology like the silicon pin, to have a sort of uh, more informative uh, way of uh, convey this, uh, the impact of this new technology, not only on the IMS, uh, but also the NDC and the end users. For uh, uh, the one that doesn't know me, I'm Romano Plenteda. I am uh, uh, managing the uh, Renew Crane unit of the IMS uh, engineering and development section. And beside me on my right uh, is, uh, everyone knows, I guess, uh, Ted Boyer, which is the chair of the ARNEC. And on my left is uh, Mr. Kanyan, Antoine Kanyan, which is uh, presenting a SEA for this very discussion. <coughs> but this is not uh, really a discussion only on, on, uh, on SPALAX and silicon pin for SPALAX. It's really the very first, uh, what we really hope, the very first uh, uh, meeting for discussing uh, uh, interesting uh, topic for uh, this community. And uh, the in order to somehow uh, manage discussion, and since uh, we are very far uh, geographically uh, in this group, uh, we try to revitalize, to resuscitate uh, uh, the concept of having an Inge portal, which was uh, developed by Paul Tsai many, many years ago, and which uh, somehow after the very um, productive uh, first uh, uh, part of the ING uh, somehow uh, died out. So there were not so much oxygen anymore. And this is time now to bring it back because of the new generation of noble gas system and um, which uh, is really bringing new science some, some, somehow. So um, we created recently a, a portal. It's a very simple uh, portal based on a sort of a chat-like where you can uh, uh, choose your topic, propose a topic to the administrator, if you think that uh, some topics are missing, and hopefully actively uh, participate uh, either uploading documents or uh, just chatting. It's a credential-based portal, so you need to send uh, to us an email for requesting. Many of you already did it, but uh, who didn't do, at the end I will, um, um, you can find our email. Please send us an email. We will uh, uh, send you the invitation uh, link. Um, and again, there are a lot of topics. Uh, many of those are already pretty uh, filled. Other are placeholders. And the idea is uh, that we present uh, this platform today. Um, and uh, some tips how to use it is rather simple and is based on classical technology in, uh, in the chat rooms and uh, document uploading. So I guess I can do this. Okay. So the objective, uh, uh, we just uh, talk about this, uh, the objective, and uh, uh, we would like to, um, in now as IMS, uh, we are in the face of uh, accepting uh, uh, different uh, systems from different vendors. We have the mix system from NIA, from Russia Federation, the Spalax NG uh, from SEA, the Sauna 3 from FOI, and then Sienta, and uh, in the case of SEA will be Sejelec, uh, the commercializer, and then uh, the Xenia International from PNNL. I see that uh, we are all uh, representing uh, this system in this, uh, in this venue. So we really would like uh, that uh, Vendors, developers, contributes in sharing information which you think uh, it's important for, uh, uh, for us uh, to in order to accept uh, the system into the IMS network uh, uh, easier and faster. Meaning uh, 
uh, if there are new um, way of calibrating the system of, uh, or um, reviewing the data and uh, the developer is proposing them, it would be nice if the community accept, agreed, and implement it in a common way. In the same way we did it uh, many years ago uh, when we developed the NCC methods in Stockholm, this was uh, also a small group of scientists uh, and which uh, agreed it in, uh, in how to implement the algorithm. The algorithm doesn't mean the software, then uh, any software can be applied if the algorithm is robust and agreed. But it uh, can be also other experience like now, and this is the topic of this uh, first kickoff meeting is silicon pin. This is very new technology for us, for, for CTBT, and there are uh, advances in, in, uh, in, in this direction. We have, advanced, we have some uh, system from Laris, which we are under test uh, now, but uh, a more mature one in terms of integration is uh, the, the pit box from Canberra, which is part of the Spalax NG. Uh, but we have also other issue that uh, I would like to bring up to the community, like uh, data set. We would like to, uh, to be sure that we are all using the same nuclear data. We have some simulation tools that uh, uh, are using the data set. And it's not so straightforward when we talk about Xenon to find uh, very new updated uh, uh, data sets, especially when we talk about uh, beta emissions. Maybe the gamma emissions and uh, uh, half-life, uh, we are not so much off, but uh, maybe the beta is not so well known. Or um, also the simulation tool itself. We heard about uh, the Justin presentation yesterday, which was uh, uh, revealing the, the, the fact that uh, there is available a website or a portal where actually people can do their own simulation using the software. And so on. So we will have other topics. and. Uh, uh, the idea that at the end of this uh, two hours meeting, we will have maybe some uh, interest uh, and uh, we can form uh, some groups uh, for a few topics. And this means that uh, we will be going uh, continue the discussion on the portal and uh, reconvey maybe during uh, the next working group B or uh, at the ING physically, but uh, virtually we should keep going this, give it oxygen so that uh, we have uh, uh, the vendors and, uh, and the developers have uh, a robust uh, agreement when they come into the network. So the adopted solution, <coughs> we wanted to have an external from the PTS side, just to give a sort of a non-political cut to this. This is a really scientific platform. We should uh, use it as such. So we rent out a space uh, from this uh, discourse and um, uh, this is a very easy to use platform. You can tune it uh, uh, as we like. Uh, okay, cost effect is not something that uh, uh, you care too much. Um, and then uh, we can uh, uh, structure the platform in categories like, like it would be file, a file system, like it would be folders. So you will have categories, subcategories, and for each of these you can uh, participate in a discussion. You just reply to the topics, to the category, and I will show you how, how we do this. Then uh, the other things that we want is a requirement, the access control, so that uh, for each chat we know who is chatting, and um, so the ownership of what uh, is uh, um, uploaded and uh, uh, the, 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 the chat itself is very clear. And also the familiarization is uh, pretty, pretty straightforward, but we want to, to show and give some tip how to, to move around this. So this uh, is, uh, uh, is very small, <laughs> but uh, mainly um, you see here the category. Those are some of those, so a few more have been uh, added uh, recently, and we see uh, a live uh, dem demo afterwards. So, but the very, very first things that you see here, you can scroll and then you can uh, uh, put category here and then you see all the category that you have. And then of course, uh, uh, if you open the each, each of these category, you can go inside and see if there are, in the subcategory post already, here you, for instance, here you have already five topics open for Spalax, some other are zero because are placeholder and so on. Um, 
how to participate. You just go to the topic, you open the topic, and then click reply here. So it's very straightforward. And you can drag a document straight into the window, and this document will be uploaded. Now, not uh, everyone wants to track all topics, and in order, you don't, you don't need to, really to go to the site all the time to see what has been posted new. So in order to help you in being active in this site, uh, the, the, what the, our suggestion is that you go to the topic, you open this menu, and then you choose watching or tracking so that if there is any new topic or any new discussion on this, on this specific topic, you will receive an email with the link to, to participate. So you, know, you, you passively will know if anything is happening. Okay, in any case, uh, there is uh, a FAQ guidelines, but again, it's really very straightforward. And uh, in order to, uh, if you want to suggest any new topics, those are our email. And if you want to, to ask for uh, having uh, access, as well. You just send us an email, uh, any of these three emails. So Vladimir Popov, which was actively uh, helping in uh, setting up the, the site, and Vladimir Gelashivi for the solution. But uh, we already put uh, a lot of um, um, last ing presentation here. If there is something missing, just tell us. If you want uh, something that uh, should be there, just tell us. We will, uh, we will do. We normally have all this uh, uh, files collected somewhere else. Maybe we have forgotten something, okay? So, if it's okay, um, before a question, I would like to show some live presentation of it. Is Vla Vladimir, are you driving that? Okay, so for instance, you can see Spalax, uh, and Spalax, uh, and you, you have the four technology, Spalax, Xenia International, Sauna3, and uh, Lares, sorry, uh, Mix. And here you can see the subtopics. So, Vladimir, just go for a reply on one of the topics, whatever, just to show how, how easy it will be then. For instance, SEA uploaded some presentation themselves recently, so you can see the user is S here. This is uh, Sylvain, which uploaded that. So we have already some sort of interaction. Here is the file that he uploaded, and again, you just drag and drop uh, the, the file here. You can uh, open, you download it, it, the file is there. So it is very, very easy. Nothing really fancy, but uh, effective. There are some placeholder, so, yeah, okay, here you, as uh, Vladimir is doing, you just say reply, you write your uh, questions, recommendation, or whatever. This will be then triggering an email to the one that asks for notification, and people can continue from there. You can also invite people for the discussion from here. Okay, if you go, if you go back to the main uh, window, the categorization. Just on the category, yes. So we have the Lara silicon pin. We have, uh, okay, without going into the topic, let me go the highlight, uh, high level view of this. And if you can close the bottom window, please. Go back, yes. Back, back. And can you close this bottom window, please? The reply window, yes. So you see the sauna, you see the Inge workshop. Yeah, we, I don't know if we uploaded everything, maybe, maybe not everything, but uh, Xenia International System, maybe we would like to have some documentation if it's possible, they are uploaded. We have zero at this moment. Of course, we could put what has been presented in the Inge, but maybe uh, something new would be nice to have because we have it in here in the, in the Inge. On the mix is also zero. So, Mr. Chernov, please, put something. And we created recently a simulation uh, topic. We talked with Justin, and Justin uh, promised me to put something there. And the data set, this year we're talking about nuclear data here. 
Okay, so this is very straightforward. So maybe we can take some question from, from here uh, on this one, what if there are. What did Justin promise you? To put some um, information on the portal that he created on the simulation folder. You never know what Justin's going to do. Any question? Yes, Justin. Uh, you had said that uh, we sent an email to you or Vladimir yes. to get access? Yes. Okay. Um, feel free to give me access and send me an email. <laughs> okay. <get in. laughs> so I started with a very small uh, mailing list from, uh, from Arnek, and then, uh, of course, people asking, can you also have this, this colleague? And so on. it's open to everyone that has interest with one only condition that you are taking active part of it. <laughs> This is the price uh, <laughs> to be there. I have a comment. Um, one of the things that we found useful at uh, PNL is to have a set of golden files uh, uh, where when you start adjusting your software for maybe new half-life correction or whatever, that you have a file that you know what the concentration is supposed to be or the activity is supposed to be. So when you change your code, you go back and you can analyze that okay. again and get the same answer. So use case. As a use, use, as case. A use case. So it might be good to have something sure. like that on here. Absolutely. Um, as, of course, if hardware changes, that's not that useful. But as the software changes to analyze that, it would be good that we have maybe a 1,000 files there of varying concentrations. So we can always go back and go, OK, so we did our uh, use case study, right. and it got the same answer, right. that kind of thing. Right. It might be useful. And I don't it know can be also from simulation or real, real data. Or right, maybe McIntyre can create them, or uh, they can be real or both, okay. uh, et cetera. Just good. something that we found uh, useful. It's a good, uh, good idea. Anything, any other idea, please, or questions? Yeah, just, just on that one, could, could we use um, previous PTE data if everyone agreed to upload their PT, of course, uh, is, uh, of course, no problem, absolutely. My, my only uh, point is that it has to be highly well agreed known concentrations, because it's going to be the very basis for, um, I mean, there could be a subfile for just examples, but also there should be golden files that everybody knows and agrees to the concentrations. And then, so we always base our numbers right. off of that. Anyway, you, Both do, of those kinds you will of do anyway a comparative yeah. uh, between. But what, when you're saying about PT, you're talking about a PT topic or the PT samples now? Your golden, sorry. Yeah, the golden files that you mentioned, I, I was just thinking that, well, in theory, we all get sent. Uh, if, if there is any, again, we can put a placeholder, there's no problem. But again, are we considering discussing about this topic. Otherwise, we fill up topic with will be dead topics and so on. So if, let's say that one. If you propose, then you should initiate filling with something. <laughs> I'll upload some files. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. Uh, regarding nuclear data, as you commented, I will suggest that through the DDP has been reevaluated for radio xenons. So I think that it could be also a good. Yes, system. in fact, the very first thing sir, is to put uh, the DDP Web or the latest uh, updated uh, that yes. uh, you are involved in, in there. Yeah. But we want more than that. We discussed it already. So we can put uh, questions or uh, re of request of uh, from people in the community that have more experience or m some other sources. Yes, or you can put a link, you can put uh, an email, you can drag anything that is helpful for the community. Okay. But thank you, yes. A along with the golden files, um, having a golden physical constants section might be useful. Uh, early on in Inga, back in 1999 or 2000, I think Justin will remember and maybe uh, Yuri Dubasov and whoever else was involved with that, we argued for, and Anders, weeks or months about the definition of NTP versus SSTP versus, you know, it wasn't just nuclear constants, but it was everything that goes into the equation. And we spent a long, long, long time about whether you should do it at 0C versus 20C 
for the definition of a cubic meter. Um, and w w ultimately, we just you know agreed on some definition, and okay. so we should make sure that those are in here too, probably. So I mean, that so a, a, a list of definition of, of all physical constants needed for for uh, analysis uh, of a radio xenon data, which would include the nuclear constants and gas constants and. Um, Maybe not the definition of a second, but <laughs> I, I don't know. But there, there'll be lots. So of you're things. proposing, you're filling it. I'm proposing that somebody fill it. Yes. No, no. <laughs> the deal is, you propose, you fill. I think Michael Fox will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other idea? You don't have to have it now. You have a time to reply later, or questions on this, or suggestion to have a different way of showing this so you need you need some time okay so okay so saying that we may go now to the very first uh, topic uh, that we find as IMS but I guess uh, and, and it was also in the working group B, uh, brought up as a sort of uh, imminent uh, need is uh, to understand a bit more the challenges of uh, new uh, system, which is probably the one that will impact more in terms of data is the Spalax NG. Spalax NG is a high resolution. It's a different definition of ROIs. You have less ROIs. This is something also that we need to consider. Is the data that are the data sites we need to find and we have, we can discuss that we have a solution to, to do that. So this will be for sure the very first system which change a bit the game and we need to understand how much does it change and what shall we do so maybe you want to introduce a bit yourself i did i just told your name yes so first of all hello everyone i'm antoine Cagnon. as you can see as it's written here uh, i will speak here uh, in the name of myself and all my colleagues of course uh, we have been working on high resolution eight one photo coincidence spectrometry for some years uh, we started with gilbert and Guillaume in 2012 during my PhD and since 2015 uh, we've also uh, Sylvain and Sergei in Defense we've been defining the Spalax NG uh, including the, this kind of uh, spectrometry for the detection of the redox xenon. The, the, the main objective of what we are doing here and explaining you is to First, answer uh, the, 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 the questions and the requests that were raised during Working Group B in February. Also, we want to synthesize the information that we have been provided uh, on the website the last month. And then we we'll also present uh, measurement equations and the calibration procedure that we propose or uh, suggest. And finally, we'll also talk about interferences. So this will be a long talk. So we, we propose to have it three in three pieces. So we may 15 minutes of presentation, question, comments. Let's keep it alive because it is really bidirectional. So yes, by starting, we uh, I take a big picture of what what's uh, the the spectrometry device that we are proposing here for the for the measure of radioxenon by doing this little schematics of what is measured what we can measure with this device, and uh, therefore what you can see in one spectrum. The, the schematic here is very, si very simple. It's a cut view of here the detection cell, here the germanium detector with the crystal on the bottom, and the two silicon pin detector on each side. Of course, you have also the carbon window here. You want to sit there? Yes, maybe. You also have the carbon window to prevent the gas from Go, going out of the cell. First of the, m the particles that you want to measure is uh, 133 xenon. As you know, it decays by beta emission that will be directly detected in the silicon pin and a gamma detector that will be detected in the germanium. So as we listed, we can measure beta and gammas. In terms of coincidence, here we list a beta gamma coincidence for this radionuclide. This is also true for 135. The gamma emission can be converted, and in this case, the electron conversion here will be detected by one or the other silicon pin detector. So you can have, in coincidence with the, with the two silicons, a beta conversion electron coincidence. 
You can also, of course, after that, measure the X-rays or OG electrons that will be emitted by the nucleus whilst uh, doing the, the conversion electron process. And therefore, you'll be able to measure coincidence with X beta or X electron conversion. X OG also is possibly visible. In terms of triple coincidence, meaning that you have each channel separately, you can see in one channel beta triggering event, X ray triggering event in the germanium, and also in the other silicon detector, you can detect an electron conversion detector, uh, electron conversion uh, signal. That's basically everything that 133 and 135 will trigger in a one dimension spectrum or in a two dimensional spectrum or in a three dimensional spectrum. If we move now to the 133M and 131M radio xenon, the decay scheme is basically more simpler. You can emit or a gamma or the coincidence of an electron conversion with an X or with an OG. So therefore, this is the signal that will be emitted by 131 and 133M. This is basically what you want to measure, and what you don't want to measure is the other. So you will have radon and radon dot progenies that we can also trigger events, and they emit all kinds of particles, plus alpha particles, that will be detected in silicon pin. So if you look at what events uh, radon and radon progenies can trigger in your detection system, you can measure all these kind of uh, patterns. And this is not everything. You have environmental radioactivity. I won't speak about it because we try to put uh, an efficient shielding around the spectrometry device, but of course you can have muon cascade. And well, muon will trigger events in silicon pins in a quite wide range of uh, energy. So you'll be able to measure them in the silicons in coincidence for the sequels, and also in triple coincidence if something from the muon trigger an event in the germanium. And that will be the muonic signal in your system. So as a summary, everything that you can measure is listing here in 1D, in 2D, and 3D. And you can have here every region of interest or every pattern from each measuring particle that is listed here with the, with the color code. That was a, a brief summary. As I said, that's the general presentation that we'll go through, and the first part is this one. Uh, we, when we rethink it, the, the new Sparlax and we wanted to improve the, the detection system, of course, uh, we wanted to improve the capacity of a Sparlax station for the Sparlax NG to, to measure metastable xen. And uh, by doing that, we had to do a coincidence spectrometry. Why did we want to keep the high resolution spectrometry in our system? It's mainly that we wanted to be able to separate uh, xenon uh, events from radon events in the, in the spectrum, but also to be able to separate each, uh, each interference between the radio xenons, and mainly from the, from the 133 xenon. As you know from, from last decades, when now we know that there is a xenon 133 background, and so it will be the majority uh, radio xenon in your sample. And if you want to be able to measure low level of metastable in, in your sample, we want to be able to separate clearly 133 and 131M, 133M. So we wanted to keep the interference as low as possible. For the detection with high resolution of photon from 30 keV to 300, 400 keV, we had to use germanium detector low background configuration uh, with, well, the crystal as close as possible to the carbon window. Carbon window because you want to be able to measure uh, X-rays. As we want to perform remote measurements, we prefer the system to be electrically cooled. So we use CP5 from Canberra. And we want to use a BG because this is the technology that has the better efficiency from 20 to 400 kV. Uh, the question of the detector robustness for an IMS station. So there have been some work from Canberra, and we also have implemented some special features for that. First of all, we have no dedicated box to transport it. And Canberra worked on the hardened configuration for the BG. Especially here, 
with the with the new flanges. So there's no more rubber uh, connection. It's a metal metal sealing, and now the the, the with this metal filling, they say that you should prevent uh, the, the, the vacuum, which is here in the detection, to, to degrade in the time. And so we are now testing a, a shortened uh, neck for the germanium detector, so to also be sure that the, the cooling of the system is efficient. And also we worked with Segelec to have something hardened in the system point of view, meaning that if you have uh, an high voltage shutdown that could happen in a station, and that you are not aware before that that this shutdown should happen, you have, uh, you have autonomy supply of electricity through, uh, through battery that will allow the computer to shut down and also the spectrometry uh, detection uh, devices like high voltage supply, low voltage supply that will be shut down before uh, before damaging the, the preamp of the germanium. The only way that you can have a brutal high voltage shutdown for the germanium is when you, you push the emergency stop of the, of the system that's for preventing uh, like human damage. In terms of high resolution electron spectrometry, uh, the tricky point is, of course I want to speak about the peace blocks here, but the tricky point is that we wanted to work at room temperature. We don't want to cool down the detectors so we had to work at room temperature for large sample, and that's uh, where we end up with this uh, silicon pin design of 1,200 uh, cubic centimeter, uh, not cubic, uh, square centimeter, uh, millimeter for the, for the silicon with uh, well, low, memory, low memory effect for measuring a, a gas mixture of xenon and nitrogen at one bar. And, well, uh, this, oh, that's how we end up with the design of the pix box after uh, three prototypes. So this is the prototype that was defined at the end of 2013, but before that we had two other uh, prototypes. So it's seven centimeter. It's equipped with two silicon detector. And uh, this uh, design was an optimization between leakage coverage of the silicon and uh, the, the, the resolution that we wanted to have for the detection of the correct uh, conversion electron. So KCE from 131M and 133M. That's the measurement that we can obtain when you measure uh, a complex uh, sample. So you have in this sample, actually no, it was a standard, but you have all the, all the radio xenon present. You have here the KCE from the 131M xenon. Here the, the KCE in summation with KX rays or L or M conventional electrons from 131M. You can see here a bit of the 133M conventional electron K, and here, well, the conventional electron K in summation with the X, or the L and M conventional electrons from 133M. You have here the beta spectrum of 133 xenon, and you can see here at the low energy side, 133 xenon K conventional electron plus uh, the X rays that are emitted by the radio xenon at uh, 30 keV. You have small detection of the gamma from 133 xenon, the K conversion of electron, the L and M conversion of electron on 133 xenon. Here you have a summation of the beta plus K conversion of electron of 133 xenon. And finally, you have the bottom line with the 133 xenon uh, beta spectrum. We, we, we define uh, a low energy threshold for the system to prevent uh, uh, discrepancy from uh, gas composition of the sample or if you have electrical noise in your system, we say that everything that is under 50 keV, we won't use it for quantification or determination of activity in our sample. Uh, the, the efficiency of one silicon pin in this geometry is 20% for the, for the conversion electron that we want, so that's full energy peak efficiency. Of course, it doesn't represent the beta efficiency. But it means that you will measure 20% of the conversion electron that is emitted from 100 to uh, 400 kV if you had to measure one. Some more works about that. The active depth is 500 micro, micrometer. Uh, this is an optimization because if 
If it's bigger, you better absorb your beta, but also if it's, big, if it's larger, we'll more absorb your X-rays. So by doing that, we limit the absorption of X-rays at 30 keV, so more especially the X-rays emitted by the xenon, to less than 10%. Uh, they are separated by approximately 7 to 8 millimeters. The total active volume in the cell is 11.8 cubic centimeters. We had carbon window outside to, of course, prevent the absorption of X-rays. Low memory effect. So this is the, the design view of the PIX box uh, from SOLIDWORKS. This is the aluminum case, the, the biggest case, in which one you can plug the, here the gas inlet and here the connections. So those ones, you have on each side one silicon pin that will enter in the, in the shape that has been pre-cut uh, pre in, the, in the aluminum case. You have carbon windows, and on the top of that, you have aluminum ring that are glued and that will keep the carbon window uh, close to the, to the, to the aluminum uh, case. The question of the detector of witness for the station, we, we worked with Cegelec to design in the process uh, a security that will cut uh, any gas inlet that, we, we, that will exceed one bar in the, in the cell to prevent uh, from exploding the cell if you inject two, three, four, five bars inside. And we also add extra shielding on the cables to prevent uh, electronic noise from a working system or for, from battery to interfere with the, with the measurement in your cell. In terms of integration, I'm not showing you the integration that's been made by Cegelec to put it in a box and do the connecting of all of this. I'm just providing to you quickly the, the shielding. Uh, the idea is to be able to get out the detector as with low time consuming as possible. So we have here a door that so that you can extract the detector without unmounting all the shielding, but just a few parts of the lead shielding. I didn't speak so much about that, but we use a Cosmic Vito, which is here on the top, uh, which is in a plug-and-play configuration. Uh, we have four channels in the Pixie 4, and uh, so we had three channels used, one for silicon pin 1, one for silicon pin 2, and one for the germanium, so there was no extra cost in, uh, for the data acquisition system to add the, the Cosmic Vito. And also what I show you here is the QC system, which is a stepper motor that goes on, on back at the good timing so to perform QC measurement with a uh, cesium-137 source, but we'll speak about that uh, later. The use of the cosmic window is not, uh, it's not for nothing. The, the gain is clear. We are more than 40% of the integral background concentrate in the gamma spectrum that is reduced. And, uh, well, as we want to do electron photon coincidence spectrometry, but also photon spectrometry of our sample, uh, then this will help to reduce the, the minimum detectable activity. Uh, some performance, uh, when I tell you that we can measure either gamma spectrometry or electron photon spectrometry, we are here, the measurement of 135 xenon in our R&D unit, Spalax, which is in uh, Brouillard Le Châtel. You have here the peak of 135 xenon, which is clearly not obvious in the background. But if you look at the coincidence spectra, and you try to subtract what are the counts from radon, which could be seen here or here. And uh, so if you subtract three counts that were taken from the region of interest that is here, from the seventh count, you have 14 counts, which is uh, way low over than uh, our background signal. And by calculating the activity, those two measurements were very close, close to the, of course, uh, minimum detectable activity, but very close also to, to each other. The, you can see it as, for, for an analyst, it's, it's possible to do a gamma spectrometry analysis on an electron photon spectrometry analysis and to compare. And when you are into low level detection, it's very useful tool to be able to look at the two spectra simultaneously because those are two different information and then it can help you decide whether or not you, you have a detection. Uh, to finish with the performance, this was already presented before, and so maybe you have seen it, but we, we followed here two systems. We have a classic Spalax, which is in green, and we follow here for the four xenon, the detection that it might have seen in the system, and we superimpose here the, the R&D Spalax that we are using, 
at, uh, for doing our, our research and development uh, uh, studies at CEA. So wasn't always measuring radioxenon in the proper way, so that's why we have a black shutdown for, the, for this system. But when measuring in 12-hour sample uh, air, we can see that we have good uh, consistency of the result between the two of them. So in green, you have 24-hour sample, and in orange, you have 12-hour samples. But you can also see that, for example, in 131M, you drastically reduce uh, your minimum detectable uh, concentration, and you can see more often events uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your national data center. Uh, finally, two, two words about the, the system. For data acquisitions, uh, for data acquisition of the, of the spectra, we use uh, the PIXI4. So we use a uh, digital uh, data acquisition with the PIXI4. So PIXI4 was already used in the system, especially for, for the SONA. Uh, we use it in list mode file, and from this list mode file, we are able to, uh, we, we produce long, uh, data files on each triggering event for, for this file, you will have which detector is triggered and how much energy is deposed in the detector at what timing. We developed uh, root software and then uh, a software for the station that will look into this file and transform it. The sof software that will look into this file and transform it and produce the IMS data is the software called SAMPA and uh, was developed one year ago at CEA, now implemented in the Spalax NG. Uh, it's lab view based to be able to control the Pixie 4 card, and it manages all the data coming from the Pixie 4. It's also managed the configuration of your system. Uh, it, will, it will manage the list mode file treatment, and he's in charge of producing the IMS file. So he will take all the data from the database, all the data from the acquisition, and produce the IMS that you will use for data treatment later. It has two modes, uh, operator or expert. The operator has a general view here, which is about to give him the possibility to see how much radon there is or not in, in his system on the spectra that are currently measured, and in what mode you are doing measurement. Are you in a QC, are you in a sample, or are you in a background measurement? And then you have the expert mode, and this one is the one that will allow you to, to tune your system, to install it, to configure the, f the filter if you want, and to change the coincidence settings. In terms of IMS, we've been working a uh, few uh, meetings at PTS also, a few video conferences to understand what kind of IMS data should be done with this new uh, high resolution spectrometer. And what we were doing right now is that we, we don't send uh, the full 2D spectra like this, but there's a, uh, well, zipping, uh, technique that is implemented into that to zip uh, all some parts of the IMS file or all the IMS file. This is currently under development, but while zipping only the coincidence spectrum, you have low uh, data output of a station in, uh, in terms of IMS measurement file per day, less than one megabyte, we think. Uh, I have now three slides, and this is not, when I say 40, it's for the total. Uh, talk, so don't be, don't be afraid. Uh, I have three, three slides now that uh, address the question that we raised uh, early this year regarding the memory effect. Uh, we, ha we had done memory effect measurement back in the past. This is present in a paper. We also see that uh, PNNL did some memory effect measurement uh, on some report regarding the Pixbox and with two techniques. So I don't, I don't represent this one because it's like not going to zero, but uh, I present the, the result of this one, and we read you also some uh, vacuum pumping uh, in, uh, in May uh, this year. And this is what we obtain uh, in log scale when you look at memory effect in the piece box, or oh yeah, memory effect in the piece box in terms of uh, time of pumping here. So last memory effect thing that we, we inject few backrays of 133 xenon, we do a sample measurement of 6.3 hours, then we vacuum, up, vacuum this up for some time, and then we redo a blank measurement for one week, and we try to estimate it with quite precision. There's two measurements actually in the, in the thing here, is that we did 
the gamma measurement and the coincidence measurement, which the two of them, they, they really fit within this, this error bar here. Uh, the zoom here is particularly interesting according to me as this time range here is time that is available for the cell to be pumped uh, during, uh, during, a, during the regular cycle of the, of the station. Because when, you do, uh, when we do a regular stress station, we have sample measuring time, and then we have one hour and 30 that is dedicated to the QC. And all this time, when you are doing QC measurement, you can pump out the air of the cell. So if you pump it at uh, 30 minutes or 80 minutes, you, you can reduce furthermore. But the, the message here is that we have lower than 0.5% uh, at least uh, memory effect from one sample to another. I said I will speak more about QC. Uh, so I did a zoom of the, of the design uh, plan here. The QC source is placed here in a little shielding that is incorporated into the general shielding of the spectrometry system. And uh, the source is protected with two small lead pieces. And you have here a stepper motor that will push and take back the QC source. You have two sensors on the, on the tube here that will indicate you whether your source is put or hot or if it's stuck in the middle. Obvious, obviously, uh, hopefully not. And to do the QC measurement, then the motor pushes the source, places it here, just in the top of the system. And what you want to measure there is this spectra. So this is the QC spectra. It's a dedicated spectra for, Simpa, for Sampa software. And you can automatically trigger the 500 kV and 300 kV here lines and see to which uh, energy it corresponds in the electron spectrum. And the idea is here, you have the Compton line of events from germanium and silicon pin. And the sum of energy here and here should be uh, the energy of the 137 cesium, so 60, 661 kV. So what we did, uh, this was April, to uh, prove the stability of the system is that during this month, uh, we leave the source on the top of the, of the spectrometry system on our R&D unit, and we keep going QC and sample measurement all the time. We analyzed uh, full and preliminary spectra, and I want to show you what's the stability of this. So if you look at the photon axis of uh, this time range, here you have the peak position in terms of channels, and here you have the peak resolution in terms of channel. Uh, variation in the time for the, for the measurement of s the, this, uh, this gamma line. If you look at the one in coincidence with the 500 kV, so hopefully the one, 161 kV in the electron axis, once again, in terms of channels for the position of the resolution, you have here the stability of the system, and if you look at the other one, we also show the stability here. Why I say stability, and for us it's fairly sufficient. We plot uh, the histograms of variation for, the, for these values in time, and then for 90%, 95% of the time, we are less than 1.4 channel difference in the gamma line, and less than two channel difference in the uh, electron spectrum, which is far lower our, uh, the dimensions of our region of interest. So that won't, that won't affect too much uh, your measurement. The small variation won't affect your, 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 your region of interest. And that's all for this first part. Thank you, Antoine. So, questions? I have some, but maybe let, let the other one, Justin. Um, very good talk. Looks like you've done, done your homework. Um, so I've got a kind of a few few questions. Um, can you go back to that last slide? Or do, because I don't like uh, watching I myself on TV. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of you you'd put it in channel space. I was wondering if the the full width or the 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 spacing on it was in energy, if you could just speak to that. So can you repeat the question, please? 
Um, so you had said two channels, and I was just wondering what what was the what does that mean in energy? Is that uh, uh, KEV or 10 KEV or? <laughs> no, it's not 10 KEV. Yeah. Uh, if we look at so, I said two channels for the electrons, 1.4. Uh, if you look here, we have 382 for 361. You can say that basically 1 kV is one okay. channel for the silicon pin. Okay. So you have 2 kV in each side. Okay. So I mean, the nice thing is, is that what that says is that both stability and, I presume, noise was not an issue over that month. No. Okay. Um, the other thing is, why have a cosmic uh, veto panel I can't imagine that it's getting rid of many counts. Uh, in the coincidence spectra, if we look at the integral background contract uh, of, so the, the, basically the coincidence spectra, you, you do, you compare two spectrum, the C ping with cosmic veto or C ping without it, and you reduce your integral background by 10, factor of 10. So for us, it was sufficient enough. Oh, that's impressive. I would not have thought that it would have been a factor of 10. Of 10. Uh, we, we actually have two papers on this. One on the effect of muon on silicon pins. That's 2014, 2015. Oh, okay. And then the, the, the comparison of those backgrounds is illustrated in my PhD thesis, so you, you're free, it's free online. Oh, okay. But it was significant, though. It's, it's, it's really significant. So it's the integral background contract. Uh, of course, if you look at the, we'll, show, we'll, we'll see the region of interest of the metastable later on. They are very small. But if you look at region of interest for 133, 135, or the radon progenies daughters, those are region tests at broadband. They are large. Yeah. So for this, this matters. You, you, with the cosmic veto, you have no cons to subscribe. Oh, or okay. background. Okay, and then the final question. The, what's the total cost to modify a Spolic system? Are we talking 20,000, 50,000, 280,000, enough to retire on? <laughs> well, I think for that you should go straight away to see Cedric, and there will, there will be about to answer these questions. Uh, I, don't, I don't deal with money much uh, regarding okay. this project. They don't, they don't answer, I already asked. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> So I would like to comment on uh, one issue on the data sites, and you were mentioning, if you can go back on the, that we, have a, we found a solution. We won't like to propose a solution, and uh, the solution is in the INGA website. Maybe we can even look at that. Um, we are trying to, we propose a, a way of compressing uh, which is still uh, uh, comply on the text, uh, Unicode text uh, um, transmission. So what we are doing is uh, we are taking out the histogram, compressing, Unicode it, and put it back in the text. So uh, there will be clear in clear the gamma spectrum, the beta spectrum, all the blocks that are normally visible, which is very nice for whoever would like to see the quality of this, of this uh, spectra as a human being. But the histogram will be compressed, and this is what makes a big difference here. And we are using uh, out-of-the-shelf uh, uh, free uh, software. Open source. But all this is, uh, this, this proposed solution will impact you, NDC, because you need to implement exactly the same at your end. So this is my first request of support and agreement from your side. Go on the Inge, look at format uh, topic, look at the proposed solution if you like it. If you have any comment, please, this is very important for us because uh, as soon we have the data to be ready to be shared, this is the way that we are seeing this. Too. So please just uh, uh, give us comment on that. Then I have another question about redundancy. and. Uh, we discussed this many times. This system is uh, Spallax Plus, so you have an extra detector, but you're keeping the old functionalities. And uh, so it's a sort of self-redundant system, both on the two silicon pin sandwich. If one silicon pin breaks, you still have the other one, possibly. And if both silicon pin breaks, you still have the gamma. Are you considering this? 
when you're calibrating the system to have all these possible fail-safe uh, options? We, we most of all consider, even the detectors are working or not, we, we consider doing the two analysis as a, as a, as a backup or as a more precise tool. Yes. Uh, this is possible. We, we don't trigger that much the deactivation of coincident spectra if silicon pins are out or not for a month. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't do that, but uh, it could be implemented. It was not uh, that important for, for us for the moment. Okay. Thank we, you. We, ha we haven't seen uh, in five years the, the only piece box that were decommissioned was because it received too much gases. It's not a question of a detector want that is not working. So we haven't faced the problem. Anders. Or. Uh, I, I think for, from an NDC data reception and data handling and data analysis point of view, I mean, the formatting issues are not about uh, compression algorithm or so I'm sure that will be okay, but, uh, but it's more the, the data that's going to be in the file that has to do with calibration uh, information, um, efficiencies, uh, interference factors perhaps, if, 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 and, and, and how those parameters are, are stored in the file, where, maybe the old IMS format is uh, accommodating this, but still one would need to know what the parameters mean for Aspalax uh, next generation system and, and um, how they are meant to be used in the analysis, of course. That, those are the formatting kind of issues that, that would be, um, um, yeah, keeping me awake when we start getting this data. So, so just open another topic of discussion. Yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, the compression algorithm, I'm sure we can... Uh, it right, but you need to be prepared to uh, install it first. But uh, beside that, the format is... Uh, so we are considering uh, changes, and we need to do some changes, clearly. But uh, there is also one uh, dif main difference, and there is the definition of the ROI. It will be in the second guest presentation. Yes. Uh, Spalax is going to use less ROIs, and, uh, and this is going to impact the software. And uh, so there should be find a common ground, common standardization on this. Maybe you can still define 10 ROIs, although you don't use all 10. It's and you, s you use the same number on the same reference of the ROI that is used for uh, Sauna or uh, other Xenia International. I think even Xenia International is using different number of ROIs. So we, we will uh, actively uh, discuss, hopefully, this in the INGE to agree on what is the standard for doing that. And because this impacts a lot the software. Yes, we, uh, well, we totally agree with you regarding the fact that uh, an IMS file should carry all the re relevant informations. Right now, what our station is sending as data is an IMS containing ROI uh, definitions, energy spanning of each ROI, uh, each channel uh, energy calibration, each channel efficiency, the one you need for the, for the, for the measurement, so gamma efficiency and ROI efficiency, and interference factor. So that's, that's, how, we, that's how we see it. So we don't think, we didn't think about putting 10 ROIs and putting 0, 0, 0 for the other. That could be an option, but for the moment we just, we, we give out the six ROIs that for us are relevant. Yeah, we just need to standardize this thing. Then. I think you kind of mentioned this with, uh, when Justin asked, but so you did the variation of the cesium for the gamma and the beta peaks yes. or gamma lines. Um, did you also look at the variation of the, th the energy threshold or does your 50 kV limit, is that high enough above that it doesn't impact our, it? our 50 kV is over that. The, the, okay. 50, the 50 kV came from mix of how can your threshold vary and also the fact that if you do 
uh, a standard measurement with nitrogen only or a standard measurement that we have 80% of xenon inside, like, I mean, stable xenon, or if you do something of pure air, uh, you have no security of whatever is your uh, efficiency at this, this energy. So we just cut. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got a few questions, if that's all right. Um, the first one was on, on the data format as well. The, uh, are we assumingly going to have a histogram which is a different size, much more channels? Is that right? Is, the, is it binned down from the, the raw the, data? The, the, the germanium histogram is basically the same as what's currently for the Sparlax. Uh, the beta histogram is also basically the same size. And then the compressed histogram is, is well, the, the, the 2D histogram is compressed. Uh, it's, it's thousand and thousand channels. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question um, is, we've got one of these in the lab, and when I get back, I would like to play with it. Before I vacuum it out, is there a, can I go too low before it goes pop, or? You, you, have, you have what? Okay. Um, so you mentioned Yes. Uh, va vacuuming it out to yes. use the memory effect, etc. Yes, yes, yes. H how low in pressure? We, we you can go zero. Uh, it's it's supposed to handle the, 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 the ultra low pressure. We just say don't put more than 1.2. No more than 1.2. No. Okay. And the, my last question, sorry, was the um, cosmic veto. Yeah. A factor of 10 seemed like a lot to me. It's was that across the whole histogram or in a specific? It's not gamma spectrum. The factor of 10 is for the coincidence spectrum. So uh, just be, be careful of that. Uh, when you look at the coincidence spectrum uh, in a proper lead shield, you already get rid of what's environmental, especially in the coincidence spectrum. So what's left is either your sample, but there I'm speaking about background, so no sample. So what's left is you could have some radon in your room, but if you have like a small room around the detector, you have very few radon, so no trace of that cross, crossing the, jet, the, the piece box. So what's left in this case are mainly uh, cosmic events. So in this case, yes, you reduce by a factor of 10. If you do a cosmic veto without charging, of course, that's not that much of a use. Brilliant, thank you. Ted? So, so I did a quick calculation. I don't know if it's right, but uh, the energy deposition in the uh, silicon would be from cosmic rays. It's their minimum ionizing. Uh, two MeV per gram per centimeter squared should be like, and it's like half of uh, 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 500 microns. So it should be in the range of like 400 keV deposition for minimum ionizing or more if it goes in an angle. Well, uh, when you uh, take the broad, the broad spectrum of, uh, of muon, cosmic muon coming, uh, by doing the simulation, the, there's, uh, the, so the, 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 the spectrum is, is wide. It goes from 100 and f 130, 140, before you have really nothing. And 140, you have a peak at 180, and actually it goes to 800 kV, depending on the angle. Goes to what? 800 K. 800 K. If you mm, go, yeah. but the, the biggest, the biggest uh, peak is 160. The, the the first thing we 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 just we, we found this by measuring the the silicon silicon coincidence spectrum. When you do this in a complete vacuum chamber in a shielding, uh, we had this like uh, ellipsoidal uh, background shape in our background, and we didn't know what was it, but by using the cosmic veto, we were able to drastically reduce this area. So then we did the JN4 with muons, and yeah. it totally correlates. So, so factor of 10 also signs ho sounds high to me, but it's maybe just the way we've looked at things in the past. The real question is, what's the change in the detection limit with a cosmic ray veto versus not? That's the real question. Uh, I... We, 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 just, we just use it, so we didn't much unplug it uh, more now that we see that it was uh, working. The thing is, we don't subtract background accounts much more. I, I show you what's, uh, what's our, our estimation for background in the next slide. Uh, and we have 1.2 counts in the region of interest of 133 xenon, and 1.3 counts or 4 counts 
uh, the precise number is our next, on the region of interest of uh, 135 and That's what we have with the cosmic veto. So we were happy with that and we just kept, kept it. The cosmic veto plays a more important role and more obvious role in the gamma spectrum as we reduce by 40% the integral background contract. Uh, then it also plays the, this role in the dedicated region of interest, especially for 133 xenon also that can interfere with the X-rays and you have less X-rays when you put the cosmic veto. Okay, uh, Antoine, we have two more presentations, yes. so I think we should move on. And the next one probably are more interesting in terms of impact on us. So the next one uh, will deal with measurement. How do we measure? How do we subtract events from each other in the region of interest? What are the region of interest and how do we calibrate or how do we suggest that the calibration procedure for a Sparax in GS should be? Uh, sample measurement, so as you know, we just place the peaks box on the top of the germanium detector. First, in terms of operation, we use a holder here, which is 3D printed, and uh, we have three screws around the peaks box, three screws around the germanium to hold uh, the system together, and be sure that once you close the door, you don't have everything that flips out. Uh, there is here environmental spectrum that we were measuring uh, last year. Yes, at the end of last year. Uh, that was luckily showing uh, the four radio xenon and some uh, interest, uh, some random dot of progenies, so bismuth and lead. There's the zoom here to go to the dedicated region of interest, and well, I don't know how Sona was or the other was numbering that, but we numbered one for 131, two for 133, three for 133, uh, so two for 133M. Just four, the other five, way six. around. <laughs> This is the first thing we should standardize. And uh, we, so the, the boxes that are here uh, precisely use the, the one that we will define. So I have listed here with the energy span of each other. And I put them into a kind of area in the, in the spectrum. Uh, so obviously, we just use the conventional electron KX rays for 131M, 133M which is located here and here. And here the region for 133, 135, and the other on the top. In terms of measurement, when we look of for a radionuclide I, so not as, we, as it's noted here, and we look to a specified region of interest, the counts in size are the one related to, the, to this radionuclide, the counts from the blank, and the counts from the sample, meaning interferences. And when we take this one, <coughs> we re put it in the right order to be able to calculate straight away the number of counts for the dedicated region of interest. We use this alpha coefficients that will directly translate from counts from region from one to each other. Uh, and we saw so the expression of the efficiency, and we use so coincidence efficiency and activity. We obtain the activity here with correction factor, so this is general for everyone. You will add here the decay correction factor, the collection, uh, volume correction factors, and you will also add the uh, 133M into 133 uh, events in there. And you just have here the total counts in your region of interest, the blanks, and the contribution for the other, divided by accretion time and efficiency. We don't separate beta or gamma or electron uh, photon efficiency we, or, and also the, the branching ratios, we keep it at, at the same number. Mm -hmm. and for Feel the free to interrupt any time and ask questions because this Always. is important to absorb. And for the calibration, we go through three steps. We want to know before calibrating, are your region of interest in the right definition of what you want to measure? You want to know what's the efficiency for the corresponding radionuclide, and you want to know what are the interference factors. So the, those, those three points are needed for measurement, and those three, uh, well, for each radionuclide, but those three points are listed in an IMS file. So let's move on to the calibration if, uh, method that we, that we suggest. We want to do it in four steps. The step one is to get uh, a gamma efficiency 
of our system. So you cannot put a gamma source in the piece box, uh, but we, we designed a radioactive standard that simulates a piece box for the germanium detector, and that's how we do gamma energy, uh, gamma energy efficient uh, calibration, gamma resol energy resolution calibration, and also the efficiency of the BG. So the design simulated piece box here, so we did it through GN4, and the idea was to use here a fake gas volume and to find uh, fake windows that we represent carbon plus silicon. Uh, so this is GN4, and that's what it really looks like. We don't have, so we glue uh, these uh, windows here on the, on the thing, and we send it to NPL, and this is current development. NPL is supposed to send it back to us by the end of July, so that we, we, we confirm that we are really, we have uh, the standard that we wanted. In terms of uh, window definition, so that was uh, uh, formed by uh, Monte Carlo simulations and looking at the catalogs of what could we supply for the material. The radionuclide mixture, so we use uh, this mixture, which is a classic mixture of uh, Spalax station that are used right now in a foam which is the same form as it's used right now. And uh, while we, we expect to have uh, an uncertainty less than 8% of the calibration that we will perform on, on this thing. So as a summary, the first step is that you take your germanium out, you took out the pig's box, and instead of it, you place this cell here, fill with the form, and do, uh, well, the measurement of the radioactivity inside for the time that you want to do it. And that could be done uh, in factory uh, pre previous to send uh, the germanium. The second step is to be sure that your region interest of interest is correct. So you have to check that the electron spectra is well calibrated. And that's used through the QC. Uh, we have always been calibrating the silicon pin with only two points because we see that we have a perfect uh, energy linearity of this kind of detector. So as I explained to you, we go to look to two points, 500 and 300 kV in the gamma spectrum. The gamma spectrum is, has just been calibrated in the step before, so we can rely on this calibration of energy here. And by using that, we are able to calibrate uh, the silicon uh, electron energy axis. And third, we'll do uh, injection and measurement of 131M in the system. So this is the chart of what is, how is working the tubing and the, the, the gas system of the NG, Spalax NG uh, station. Briefly, you have here the hair input, the compressor, cube, membranes, ovens, oven three, detection cell, TCD, and uh, archive racks. Uh, we have a few set of uh, deck here, and you can directly, if we we'll take here, deck inside that an archive that contains 131M xenon, and by putting it to vacuum and then opening it, be sure that you have less than one bar at the end in the cell, but you can inject by, uh, by this mean uh, 131M xenon in the cell. The trick point is we know the efficiency of our gamma spectrometer. So we would quantify the activity of 131M that we have just inserted there via gamma spectro, and then we use this gamma activity to calibrate the efficiency in coincidence for 131M. We use also this uh, ratios in terms of uh, probability for the, for the X-rays between 133M and 131M to get the efficiency from 133M xenon. And the thing is that the precise activity that you have injected from here to here is not needed. That's due to the fact that uh, maybe the activity that was shipped from the first time was not standardized enough, or maybe that you have, uh, you don't exactly know how much tubing you have here, so you don't want to lose time into estimating the dead volume inside that, etc., etc. You just know how much gas you put, you, you know the, that you have put gas here, and by the gamma measurement, you directly have your activity. If you try to do the math and say we want to calibrate a station that is uh, located one month away from 
uh, well, Fibersdorf laboratories, because this is the standards that we are using. With these methods at only one bar, we think that dozen becquerel is enough to uh, standardize a station. So that's the, the first step. For the fourth step, we do the same with Xenon 133 by using uh, 100 becquerel. And that's all. Of course, we don't, I don't mention too much 135, but the decay of 135 xenon is too quick to do this kind of measurement if you're in a remote location. Uh, we, we rely on two things. First, we rely on our Monte Carlo simulations. And if it's not enough, you, we think that we can calibrate our systems on the first radio, uh, xenon 135 uh, detection. If you do the gamma measurement, you have a detection of 135, so you know what activity you have and you'll know what you have in your region of, of interest, so you'll be able to calibrate it this way. So those are the first steps, and I did a, a small schematics that you, you've seen to uh, well explain how it works. So first steps, gamma calibration. Second step, QC source measurement, and you define your region of interest. First steps, you do 131M xenon gas injection in your cell. You use the gamma calibration to quantify the activity. And then by cons in the region of interest, you can calibrate 131M xenon and 133M xenon. And you do the same for 133 xenon. By doing this in this order, you're also able to get interfer the, 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 the interference factor from 133 into the region of interest of 131M and 133M xenon. And that's my last. Take care, Anton. Anders. Anders Anderson. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, so just to the uh, everything is sort of anchored in the efficiency calibration when it comes to efficiency of, of the absolute efficiency calibration of the of the um, gamma spectrometer first, and that uh, hinges on the validation with your. Um, that is validated, the, I mean, the, that you are in fact have a good simulation uh, source is validated with this uh, Giant for Monte Carlo model, yes. is yes. correct? Yes. Is that right? So, so the, this calibration of the system, efficiency calibration of the system is dependent in the end on, the, on this Monte Carlo model. It's, right. uh, it's yes, the, the thing that I should have added is that it's not an absolute calibration by Giant 4. It's a relative calibration by Gen 4. I mean, we have the piece box in Gen 4. We have all the, all the layers and stuff. I did the gamma uh, calibration of this cell, and then I designed the other cell, replace. So we didn't trust into the absolute one, but be sure that doing the ratio of the gamma efficiency of those two uh, volumes, uh, we were getting less than 3% uncertainties in the in gamma spectra. Yes. Just, just or yes. uh, the other hand, or yeah, okay. Thank you. I, I just uh, you have um, you're suggesting this as a method. Uh, yes. But what have you done so far? Because you have presented data before. Yes. Uh, and you also presented MDCs, for instance. And, and uh, how did you get those efficiencies? We uh, we've been performing measurement with the peace box uh, using standard gas for uh, since uh, 2012. The first standard that we were using. Uh, are from 2012, and we, we've been doing the Monte Carlo GN4 of this setup since 2013. And by doing this and doing this again, we, we, we were pretty co confident several times that the first numbers that we had were true. So in the lab, we know that we use this, these numbers. The idea here, the new method, or why do we pr suggest a new method, is that in our lab, we were able to take the piece box, take a uh, 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 gas, transfer device and be sure that we inject from a standard into our piece box 80% of our gas. So we knew that we had 80% of the standard in the piece box, then we were doing the measurement and we knew that exactly before what activity we had. The question here is how to do this uh, in the field in a system that when you're not sure, absolutely sure that you will transfer all your standard there, it's from an archive to the piece box, you will get 15% transfer in this way. So then you have a lot of incertainties if you trust this thing. And you have to calibrate all these uh, 
tubing of gas steps to be sure that you can say, yes, this activity in the piece box that we have inserted is exactly 15% of what we have injected. Do you know what I mean? In the lab, in the lab we are 100% sure of what we put it because we have small tubings a piece box and we do it in our certified uh, detectors. Here we speak about something that you just don't control totally. Um, uh, you're doing great. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I, I guess as a, first a comment, uh, and I think this is for all of the systems, I believe that every single detector that goes out into the field should be calibrated with all four isotopes, or s should at least see all four isotopes. Now what you can put out in the field, it's true that you can't get Xenon-135 out there, and 133M is, is tough. But back at the workshop, every detector should see all of these isotopes so that you have at least those spectra. That's my comment. So go ahead. Just before your question, we, we see it. The question is how much can you see? When a detector get out from, from, uh, from, from Segelec or got out from Canberra uh, with a piss box, it will be able to see uh, 100 millibequerels of 135 very easily. The question is, how much can, how, which, how much certainty can we, can we quantify 0 0.5, 0 0.3 millibequerels per cubic meter? Well, so that, and that kind of brings up my next question, is that because you're making a coincidence measurement, there was a technique that was developed back in the 1960s that utilized that very constrained geometry. Your efficiencies are fairly high, the solid angle, uh, for uh, your betas, your gammas, um, and because of that, the, you can go back and find out the activity of a pure isotope that you put into it. And that was a paper that we put in, I, I published, uh, I guess, in 2014. And it, the, it works pretty well. It works in that the errors that you get on it and the uncertainties that you get on it are of order 3% or less. And so that's another thing that I'd, I'd suggest you look at that in terms of what you're injecting in it because now you've got two ways. One of them is you pinpoint the gammas. You've got that. And now you've got a way of doing beta gamma coincidence that tells you the total activity that's in your detector. And now you have to uh, unfold the physics, uh, the branching ratios, and whatnot. But at the end of it, you get a, you get a very accurate, I believe, um, efficiency measurement. So that's, that's just a suggestion to look at. Yeah. This is what the sauna or the NCC method is doing. So you don't, you don't need to have an absolute activity to calibrate your system because of the 3D three, three spectrum, I mean the 3 spectra at your disposal. But Antoine, you have your own uh, view on this. Yes, and, uh, uh, we... On this specific we, geometry. Yeah, we, we, we have our own views. Basically, uh, the idea is that when you do a beta gamma coincidence, you can use beta spectrum or gamma spectrum and divide uh, the signals you see in each of them if you have a pure standard. and understand what's your efficiency in beta gamma or what's your efficiency in gamma or what's your efficiency in beta. Uh, the, there are several points that are assumed in this method and we think that at least two of them are not uh, true or cannot be assumed easily in our system. First, you assume that you have no angular correlation. We have no idea what are the angular correlation between gamma and betas and we don't think that uh, we, this will lead to uh, better, uh, we don't want to go too much into details to that right now. The second point is the, the geometry of the system, because when you do absolute gamma measurement, beta measurement, and beta gamma measurement to do coincidence, you have to assume that you have symmetry, a perfect symmetry of your system, which is not true for our photon detection. If we had the first slide of the first presentation. Please. I will just basically explain what we think could happen is that detection pattern of silicon pin one with germanium and detection pattern of silicon pin two with germanium is not the same. And that's, that kills it, in fact. You don't have... I, well, the nice thing is, is that you actually collect you collect the data and the analysis could be done. Um, and I, I do not disagree with you. I just, 
Is it yes. 2% or is it 50? Actually, we, we, we all see uh, first. Secondly, uh, xenon measurements are not that easy to be made, uh, especially for us in, in CA. We have highly constrained in terms of radio protection, and we cannot easily do xenon measurements uh, in our labs. You can do it if it's environmental. You can do it if it's PT sent by, by, by uh, CTBTO. Uh, but when you get to uh, Xenon standards that you have ordered from someone, then you'll face some problem if you don't control totally what you do. So for us, it's not, uh, it's not a method that is uh, to be privileged. If we have no choice, of course, uh, why not? But for the moment, we have something that we, we trust could work. The thing is that with that, we have the total uh, gamma calibration. And, uh, and uh, well, our experts in our ADC, and we all uh, really trust into gamma measurements. And we want to be able to have something uh, standardized in this geometry in gamma measurement. It's how we've been always doing, and it's, very, uh, it's a good precious tool to see what you measure. If something exotic appears. Uh, thank you. Uh, one, one last question. The, your regions of interest, you had two regions for radon, if I'm correct? Yes. I guess I don't quite understand why you have two. And one of them is business. Two yeah, it's, it's part three. Beg your pardon? It's in part three. It's in part three. It's we, for we, the next slide. In oh, the next okay. presentation. Sorry. Antoine, why? Uh, did you compare the two methods, the absolute and then the relative on xenon or the full relative method? Just to see, for instance, if it's true that we have a strong angular correlation or if it's true that these asymmetries. We have observed this for 141M uh, thing, that we had uh, a few percent of difference into the efficiency of silicon pin 1, silicon pin 2 with the germanium. A few percent. But if you consider as a global uh, beta cell... Actually, we didn't do it like that. We, we, uh, we have always, in our lab, uh, standardized uh, one and two, and did the summing of the histograms later on. Angular correlation is one of the topics that I uh, would like also to touch in this uh, website. And maybe... Uh, because if there is, it's true that there is angular correlation, when we are simulating spectra, we are not taking this into account, so... Actually, GN4 take them into account in the last version. You have angular correlation data? Uh, yes. I'm not sure if it's for beta gamma, but at least for the gamma gamma, no, the last version of... Right, the but the fact that uh, you, ca you can take into account is something, but if you know how much is to yes. be as an input, this is the question. So, if this community has any idea or any resources to do this kind of... Uh, uh, research on the angular correlation on the xenon isotope, yeah, that would be... Really that, that's it's actually, you can just measure uh, xenon 133M to 133G as a function of time. I think that should solve it, because 133G cannot have an angular correlation between the betas and gammas, because they're two statistically different processes. There's a six nanosecond half-life between the emission of the beta and the gamma, so that cannot have an angular correlation. Unless, it can, unless the atom can remember six, for six nanoseconds where it emitted from, which it can't. Maybe. So if you measure 133M to 133 ratio as a function of time, and it does not follow the ingrowth, then that will show there's angular correlation. So, that should be so you need to inject radioactive xenon into your system, and lots of it. So, this so move it to PNL, we'll do it there. <laughs> uh, So I hope you're going to write it down, this, and put uh, Derek it in Haas, the ing portal. Derek Haas will do that research. He's <laughs> online right now. Okay. Any other question? We, it's already 7 o'clock. We have one more, but maybe Quick. one more question, please. So I was glad to hear that you do the comparison of the two silicon pins um, for the efficiency, because that allows you to, if one goes down, you can still use the detector. Um, have you looked at the interference ratios of 133M into the 131M region from the backscatter, or...? No, that's the uh, next part. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> For the ones that are still weak. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the last part is, um, is part three. It's 
called concept validation. I'm showing you rapidly what's background measurement here, and then we go to uh, interference. We wanted to prove that we had low level interference uh, by doing Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and we also can provide some of the measurement, but uh, most of the time you'll see that uh, they are low, and that's what we want to prove here. In terms of background, this is what we had for, for background. Uh, it was seven days, this one here, with, with Cosmic Vito. And this is on the prototype of uh, research and developments. It's not the one or other that we could have been published in the Gamma Q spectrometer. We'd have a larger uh, shielding. So that's, that's the one that we get when you, we use the shielding that is planned to be installed on a, on a station. And in 10 of cons, in the region of interest, they are all listed here. Uh, so you go to very really few cons in seven days in the region of 133M, 133, 131M xenon, and you have few tens of cons in the other region of interest. When we take back these ratios and put them to the right counting time, we have very, 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 very low uh, number of cons in 131M, 133M, and we have one cons basically in the in the other. And that's why we tell you that we don't we don't consider uh, background cons to be subtracted in the region of interest. As I said, there's a second under. And then the they are very small. <laughs> the the interference. So the yellow the yellow is for the next uh, animation. If we look at interference, uh, they, are, they can have several origins in our stuff. Uh, you have backscattering of electrons, partial energy deposition of the beta electrons in the silicon pin. Uh, 500 micrometers of silicon pins, it's not enough for all the, all the betas to deposit all their energy. But this is not a problem for us. What we want is that a beta triggers an event. We don't obviously want to collect all the energy of a beta. But of course, then, uh, you can add to uh, other regions of interest in that. You can also have interference when you have electrons struggling in the gas. And in terms of photons, well, we all know the Compton effect. <coughs> and also, you can have germanium X-ray escape. And you can also have uh, conversion electrons, X-ray coinciders for the, for the lead 214, for example. The, the point is, the signatures, they follow a predictable pattern. If you, have, if you know how, what's the interference factor from one region to another, uh, if you have 10,000 counts on one, or one million counts in one region, and you know how much they do in the other region, then you just have to multiply the, the counts from one region to another. So the idea is to uh, fill up this matrix uh, with the alpha coefficient that was presented before to correct from uh, the cons in their own region of interest here, in the region of interest of this radionuclide. I have added the background here because we have to subtract it for the, for the measurement. And uh, well, as we just see, it's negligible for the metastable. And here you have back square because of course, uh, you should just put the efficiency in this line. Is the question is how to fill up this case. And it's not, it's not easy because if we look at this kind of measurement that we have, uh, we don't have enough statistics. You don't have enough statistics to understand what's the interference of 5 xenon into those ones. You don't have enough statistics to understand what's the interference of bismuth or lead into the other one. And we distinguish the two of them. And we don't know also, also uh, exactly what there's not enough interference in this region to, be, to know precisely what, how much do you interfere. And then you also have activity especially for radon and bis, uh, plant, uh, lead and bismuth, you, we, we did Monte Carlo simulations to be able to estimate one another. Why, why do we want to separate uh, bismuth and lead uh, interference? Is that when you send preliminary spectrum or full spectrum, you want to send the same uh, configuration file. I, I don't, we don't want to uh, estimate interference factor of uh, lead and bismuth after two hours, after four hours, after six hours, after six hours thirty. And in all this time, the ratio of lead and bismuth, they change. So if you just give one interference factor, uh, to which ratio it corresponds between lead and bismuth? It's not, it's not enough. So we give one interference factor that realizes how much comes from six goes to one, how much comes from five goes 
to one, and that's whatever the acquisition time is. And it works for four hours acquisition times, it works for eight hours acquisition times, or it works for 12 hours acquisition time. Uh, the estimations of those factors, they are quite delicate. And we know they're low, and it's still a work that we are doing currently at CA to estimate the really on the field, what do they look like. Uh, we'll use uh, pure radio standards for 133 and 135 and 131M, 133M uh, inter interference. But for the moment, uh, well, what I'm going to present you is GN4 simulations, and uh, not with hundreds or 200 scores, but we went to, to push it a bit harder, and it's 10, uh, 10 million decay of each radionuclide. So that's why it's going to be a bit uh, shocking. But the goal is to see that they are low. This is the coincidence spectrum that you obtain. Resolution is, uh, is active for 131M xenon. We've here the region of interest. You're going to tell me why do we estimate 131M xenon uh, interference? It's, it's pretty low. It should be very low, but the, the, the question was just to say what number? What number is low for, for our case? Uh, uh, 133M xenon is here, so we know that it won't interfere. Uh, bismuth lead, we don't talk of it, and also 135 xenon, uh, we don't talk of it. But if you look at the intersection with the 133 xenon, you have some cons. And uh, we estimate it at the A to the 10 power minus 5. So as expected, they are very low. Uh, that's, that's the zoom of the region of interest here. Uh, then 133M xenon, you will have a little interference here, and you will have here interference that can be uh, important. Actually, when you estimate it, it's 10%. Uh, so this is Monte Carlo simulations. It's very important that you'll be able to estimate it uh, at a point precisely. The thing is, you, we have never seen uh, 1,000 becquerels of 133M xenon in our sample, so we don't take that much into, co into, co co into consideration for the moment. If we look at 136 xenon, that it gets more tricky. So you have very few cons to 135 xenon, so that won't be too much of a, of a problem. And if we look here at the region of interest 131, M xenon, 133, M xenon, we have, uh, of course, interference. These are the closest regions. We, we, we limit our region of interest. You can choose two regions of interest, but we limit the region of interest to lower uh, of the peak of 133 uh, X-ray xenon. Uh, I did here this, uh, the zoom of this region here so that we can see a bit of the physics that's behind of this interference. Here you have the uh, Compton from gammas of 133 xenon, so it basically 10 counts in total, it's not much. Here you have the tail of the Cal phi X-ray absorption in the spectrometer, and here you have part of the 133 xenon Cal phi X-ray that can change from the germanium uh, depending on the resolution. That's where the resolution calibration is very important for us. That's also why we want to keep BG. And that's also why we went from BG 5030 to uh, 3830 uh, right now to the system. And if we go to numbers, then we have, uh, well, 0.8% and 0.4% of interference in this region. Those, of course, uh, it's Monte Carlo. It depends of, on your resolution. So it could depend uh, strongly from one system to another if your germanium shifts a bit. 135 xenon simulation. Once again, uh, it's not really common to see uh, 10, 000, uh, 10 million events of 135 xenon in a, in a measurement. But if we try to estimate, you will have counts in the bismuth and in the lead region of interest. You can have events in the 133 xenon, and you can have small events also in 131 m xenon and 133 m xenon. So 0.9 percent, 0.002 percent, and 0.4 and 0.9 to the uh, 0.09 percent. Then to the bismuth on the lead, so they don't have the same, the same uh, influence. Here we see the bismuth uh, lines, and we do two other zooms, so radio of interest of 133M, uh, 133 xenon at 81 kV, pretty far away from the X-rays of lead, so there's not much of a problem. The line you see here, so it's the coincidence of 
conversion electron and X-ray for the lead that can, uh, that can, that happens in the decay scheme. And by keeping a uh, good energy resolution at 80 kV, you're able to separate this region. And also here, it's unlike the, the, the fact that you want to keep high resolution at 81 kV. Uh, 135 xenon is pretty far away from the line at uh, 24 to uh, 245 kV. And if we look here at the 131M and 133M, you have few lines from the lead, but they are very uh, low levels. So you have interference of bismuth into lead and lead into bismuth. That's lead into bismuth. We have small interference here for the 135 and 133 xenon. And we have here interference uh, from those regions. And finally, the bismuth, which is a dense, dense spectrum. Uh, here we are much more closer. So once again, uh, resolution at 81 kV is important for the system. And here, no particular pattern can be seen uh, for 131 m xenon, 133 m xenon. So that's pure Compton and pure beta deposition in the spectrum. And you have here the numbers. So that's, that's the final uh, presentation of this interference factor estimated by, uh, by GN4. Uh, we use this color code here. So basically, uh, that's uh, first order interference for 131M will be 133M. But as usual, there's no much 133M xenon. So you should consider also interference for 133 xenon and maybe at 0.2% uh, or 0.12%, the interference from the uh, radon progeny is interference from 135 xenon is totally negligible. If you look at 133M, you'll have a uh, major interference from 133 to a low level, but that's, the, that's something that shows the most. And also low level interference of uh, uh, bismuth and lead. And 131M interference in 133M is totally negligible. If you look at 133 xenon, 133, here, that's the color code here, meaning that for those radon clyde, the major interference are those ones. Uh, here, it's particular one is that I don't simulate the decay of 133M into 133, and then triggering event is actually in the region. And then it's negligible. Uh, and finally, we don't consider that much interference of 135 in the land and bismuth regions. And that's more also more complicated. Uh, so that's the, that's the basic matrix. And if we want to go straight to the jobs more simpler, we have to consider mainly two things, interference of 133M and 133 in your samples or the interference of the red on the drugs. Uh, if we want to estimate a bit of what's, how far away are we from these numbers, it's pretty touchy. Some numbers, when you, when you do a radon measurement in the SPAX in G, that we are currently uh, trying to finish uh, with Sejolec, we were able to inject uh, radon into the system, so we estimate how much uh, do they interfere. Uh, as we can see, bismuth should be an order of magnitude more important into the background. So I plot here the number of cons in the region of interest of bismuth as a function of the number of cons in the region of interest of 135. We do the regression on the high cons points. And uh, that's the zoom for the low energy region, to be sure. And we have here this correlation. And there, I do the same for 133. But in this case, as you see, they are about the same num num digits. So I plot here the total cons in the region of bismuth plus twice time the total cons in the region of the lead to the regression on the high cons event. And I give you a zoom at the low, uh, low, low number of cons region. Meaning that in a regular operation, the worst case that you can get is 500 cons is very, very, very bad. We, we, we expect to have a system between 0 to 100, 200, 200 or 200 cons in the, in the regions. And that's uh, basically all I have. Then it's, it's a classic conclusion that you will, that will go, but maybe we should go to that just at the end. So, no? 
Oh, okay. So uh, we, we, we did uh, risk and strong points, basically. Uh, there was a question about the new technology. It's true that it can be new, but it's still pretty old for us. Uh, as uh, we've been working, I mean, I've been always working with it since I'm CEA uh, for the five last years. Uh, limited detection efficiency, it's true, but that's totally, uh, but that's a technological choice that we, that we, that we assume as we, we choose high resolution instead of high efficiency. Uh, the fragility of the germanium, and especially the BG, it's a well-known issue. Canberra is working on this. We have put more protection also to be sure that we don't uh, break the preamp uh, when in operation. Uh, over pressure fragility of the, of the piece box and uh, electromagnetic sensitivity. Uh, we, the, 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 the shielding of, the, of this have been worked on with a special case that is designed by CGLEC will integrate uh, as a filter on the power inlet and we also do extra protections on the cables. Uh, and should, should, it is expensive, the high resolution is expensive, but uh, also we try to limit this by using a BG3830. Uh, and the strong point, well, the strong points, we have the duality of this system. We can, we can do photoelectron or direct photon measurement. That can be useful. If we have a lot of activity, we don't bother too much into doing current signals. Because really, analyzing a gamma spectrum is the, is the easiest way of getting your activity. Uh, you have high resolution, so we have limited background interference. Uh, by doing low background interference, then you can hopefully expect uh, low, low MDCs. Uh, we propose, what we propose is a technological, technological continuity, uh, especially regarding germaniums, because stations operator I used to germaniums. We have a high detection range. Uh, if you do a long time measurement with this system, you can go to micro backwards and you can also measure uh, high contrasts uh, if you just consider the germaniums. Uh, we consider that we have no memory effects and also the energy calibration uh, is, is stable for us. Okay. And well, that's like a small, small sentence from the end. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Antoine. Questions? <laughs> Anders yes. Ringbom and Justin. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I, one uh, comment and one question, I think. And the first one is, all these interference factors that you're, you, you're taking quite painstaking uh, uh, calculations to determine. Have you, have you considered instead of using the RI method, use peak fitting? Because then you won't need it. Uh, because you have this high resolution, so, so that you should make use of your high resolution. Yeah, that's, so that's... Just skip that. <laughs> Oh, you, one. You, you're not the only one to say it, so <laughs> uh, good point. Uh, and then I just thought you said, the, the detector cost was 20% of the station cost. Does that mean, not the system cost, but the cost for the entire station? That's what you mean? So in, including, for instance, infrastructure and everything? Yeah, there's a approximately equal to. Yeah. There was the detector only, not the... Yeah, I understand. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, um, having... having um, gone off and getting hundreds of these spectrum every week and thousands of them a month and tens of thousands a year. The operational side, I think, is really important um, to keep in mind. And once you've, got, once you've collected a spectra, there is all kinds of things that you can do with it if you've got the time and the desire. And typically, it's, it's more the desire than it is the time to really go into in-depth detail and analyze these things. So peak fitting, I think, is a great, great method. You're not going to do that for every specter that you collect because you don't care about every specter that you collect, unless we get great automation on it. So, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important is to um, 
make sure that on the operation side that the automatic analysis is, is straightforward, simple, and the analysts don't spend any more time than they already are on spectra, uh, and the analysis of the spectra. And then we, as a community, we need to develop advanced beta gamma analysis tools. And that's, we've, we've done a number of these things over the years, kind of getting there piecemeal. But uh, just keep in mind that, so the difference in regions of interest to me is a concern. Um, you talked about the, the um, interference with the bismuth and the, and the lead. You're absolutely correct. But it looked like your interferences were so small to begin with uh, that, you know, automatic analysis, you don't care. Um, so, again, I mean, that's, that's just one of the things. Keep, I would say keep that in mind in any changes that you want to make to the regions of interest and the formats from what we're currently doing for automatic analysis and the analysis that the analysts are going to have to do on the on these data sets. Okay. Uh, maybe this, your comment goes also with uh, Anders comment regarding peak fitting or, or region of interest. Uh, according to us, region of interest is the most straightforward method for a computer to, to deal with a spectrum. And uh, doing peak fitting in, in a spectrum of high resolution, when Romano is totally for, for it, uh, we, we say, why not? The thing is, we have really low efficiency. When you measure 0 0.2, 0 0.1 millibequerels per cubic meter, when you measure few counts, it's really few counts. It's six counts, seven counts, eight counts. So if it's six, seven counts, eight counts, uh, in, a, in a region of interest that's still quite wide over channels, y y peak fitting doesn't mean that much for us. Really, subtracting counts from other region of interest is, is way simpler. Of course, if we have more activity, then we, do, we could do peak fit. But once again, if we have more activity, we think that we can see it in gamma. And that's also straightforward on a, on a job that we are very uh, certain of what we're doing in it. Uh, okay, I understand the point. But I still think if you know your, your uh, resolution and your, your, where you are in your channels, you can lock parameters. You can fit even very low statistics, so that's, you can, you can try that. Yeah, well, we, we do. Two questions that are kind of for you, kind of for everybody. Um, do you do state of health monitoring of kind of like the dark current over time or anything? Or what all have you added in for state of health monitoring of the detector? Uh, it's still in a, uh, it's still an open subject. We we monitor the uh, the voltage, applied or not. Uh, you could also monitor uh, leaking vol uh, current from the germanium. You could uh, monitor stuff. We don't. We have actually not implemented that much of uh, informations. Okay. The the thing is, you could monitor the the QC the QC stability, yep. or resolution. Okay. So you show the equations for the analysis. Do you have tools for the analysis, or do you already have the routines kind of programmed in? Uh, we we had uh, routines, uh, uh, root routines, working uh, for us, but or, yeah. but not something that's uh, well developed. We are working on the software for the for the NDC that the that are receiving spectra that the. That was going to be my next question: Is what will be needed for the IDC or NDCs to? So we're not we're not yet in the I, into sending to IDC. Uh, some time still in front of that, uh, but we also need to analyze it at home first, and um, that's a, that's a software development that's currently under. But uh, we don't. I mean, you, you you have everything you want in the IMS. Okay, okay. I think we should stop here for. A this presentation and uh, resume a bit uh, what are our needs now. And uh, first of all, uh, in a sort of agreement of which is the method that we like. For, uh, re for uh, we're talking about peak fitting and uh, ROI definition. But uh, this community, I think, uh, should come uh, and comment. And this presentation will be on the Inge portal and uh, to comment if this method is agreeable or not. What is the, the problem that we see and the challenges before we start implementing this in, uh, before we, we look if our current software 
can be fine-tuned or even be already okay, or if we need a substantial software uh, uh, development. I hope that uh, SEA is providing support in uh, software, but on the other end, I think we should go to have an independent software development using the same algorithm for benchmark. I mean, bug, uh, uh, and yeah, the idea of that using standard spectrum is very important when we are benchmarking, but also spike, we, have, we can all go in directly on the hardware. But um, I would like to have your opinion in uh, who can have uh, resources in looking at these methods, there will be a first discussion group, a small group, subgroup of people which uh, can help us in uh, looking at the method proposed and see if there are any advancement or suggestions so that uh, we have a sort of direction from the, the, the community where to go as as, as, IM, as um, PTS but also the NDC at the end. So can, uh, can we have a, a, a substantial number of uh, interest people to comment on that? Can, can you raise hands if you see that you are only two? Come on. No. Rainbow. Maybe, maybe Anders. I Anders. Comment on the methods, at least uh, having some, some ideas. Romano, I have a, a one or two comments. Yes. We've talked about a lot of new things. Uh, nuclear data is one of the things we talked about, yep. angular correlations, new calibration techniques. We've talked about shorter sampling times at this S&T. We talked about elimination of background counts, which I think everybody knows what I feel about that. Um, whether there's a memory effect in the detector or not, that's a separate issue. Uh, we've talked about the use of one photo tube versus two photo tubes for plastic readout. We've talked about modification of the Stockholm equations for silicon, which we call the silly stock equations. Um, so we're, we're in an exciting new phase, so, but we're in a new phase. Right. So we're analogous to where we were in around year 2000, in a sense. I mean, we're much better off because the, the future is brighter as far as, you know, better detection limits, et cetera. But uh, and, and it's the kind of infusion that I think we need for the noble gas community. But I think we need to talk about more about like a process than can you do it, can you do it, can you do it? Because there's so many things that we need to do, I think, uh, with the fact that there's, you, there's four new systems coming online. Right. Um, I gave a talk at Inga in the University of Texas, I think it was, or one of them where I suggested a thing called Inga 2.0, where we get together and run, I don't know if we run systems side by side or something like that. But I think considering all these new issues and, and us pushing the boundaries, it's something that we need to consider doing. Uh, and when I say we, that's the PTS probably has to take a lead in it um, with help from state signatories. And I believe that you can get that help uh, I've talked to uh, BFS already. They, they theoretically could host again, theoretically. Uh, and all this, this takes money, but like I said, we're, we're in a new phase. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and now I think is the time to start thinking seriously about some kind of activity as opposed to thinking about research. Because we've been doing research for years, where now I think we need to do an experiment, let's call it, or something. To, to answer a lot of these questions that, that we have. That, that's my opinion, anyway. Anders? Yeah, okay. I'm, I think that, uh, yeah, I agree, of course, what you say, Ted, uh, but also a comment on the method of work here, because I think that the developers should be responsible for their own systems. And we, if, if you invent a new detector, you're responsible to be able to calibrate it and, and everything. And we have seen that now, that's fine. I mean, and you suggest a method for that, but that should be taken care of by the developer themselves. We cannot sit in a big group and, and uh, like inventing everything for everybody. Uh, I mean, like that, I, this, that, uh, this according to my opinion. So I think one way to, for instance, check this calibration method would be that you do that 
and then you come up with uh, 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 the calibrated detector, and then we can have an in intercomparison exercise, for instance, between different systems, and then we can just compare, see that, okay, then it's okay, okay, fine. That's one way to do it, for instance. Uh, so, so let me comment on, on this and uh, what Ted uh, said before. We are in a different phase, but we also have a much uh, different capability. We have um, certified labs, which can intercomparison our our system, which were not uh, in the first generation. So now we don't. I don't think we really need to co-locate again the fourth system. We can uh, send a spike to the lab, which we trust, and we can do for, uh, and we will do for uh, the fourth system. So we know that uh, in the in the PTS we want to have a one year. <coughs> full test, 95% uh, availability under the IMS requirement. This is, or this is a process that uh, it's, a, it's the, the core of this. How do we do this? The problem that we have is now, how do we evaluate the one year if we don't have a tool to evaluate it? So when I'm talking about uh, software to review the data, then all the rest is important and we will put in the process. But the first thing that we need to do is to be able to come with a concentration. And then uh, we spike it every month or every two months or whatever, and we send to the lab to see how the, uh, the system, but how do we and you and DC evaluate the system if we don't have a, even a tool to do it? So I think the first thing is to ask here, can you provide a tool? But also do we agree that this is uh, the right algorithm to be used? I mean, we did for the NCC method. The community agreed how to evaluate sauna, Arix, ARSA at the time. That was similar language, and we and with the community decided that, or agreed. Someone proposed it, the other one agreed, they refined, and so on. We need to do the same now. Regarding tools and analysis and uh, how, we, how we perform and, and sharing these tools, uh, you think we all know that uh, getting, uh, getting a home when homemade software to someone else and hoping that these people will easily take it in hand uh, is, is quite complicated. I mean, uh, once we have something that is industrialized for the, for the use of analysis that have been performed by a, a certified company, we, can, we could ask the question, uh, is it legal or not to, to share it? But as long as we use homemade tools, and we developed these tools at our place, so we are able to analyze our data. It's not to say our, it's our, but it's... Yeah, that's precisely it, it's not. It it's belongs to the state signatories. That's the problem. For, is for, the, for the moment, we sp I'm speaking about R&D data that we are performing at home. Thing, yeah. uh, of course, once, uh, once you have a system that is constantly sending data to PTS for, for experiments that CTBTO paid for, uh, we agree that everyone should be able to analyze this, but for the moment, we, we are not in this phase. As I told you, we have, we have software, we do analysis. Some of these codes are root, some of these codes are C++, some of these codes is on some guy's desk, some of these codes are on my computer. We don't have a unified tool at home that we can provide you and that you could use and that you could say a uh, thing like that. When you speak about software, we have, we have legal issues, and also we have uh, consistency issues between the ones that are using it. And nobody needs it today. No. But it does need to be done before it gets into operations. We can't, before we start the one year. Yeah, first. before we even start certification of the technique. I mean, uh, I get it, but we have total software issues and propriety, all that, too. Um, we had to overcome those uh, in order for it to be adopted. Uh, for the IMS, um, and, and I, I know what, what Andre said, we can't really sit in as a community and, you know, whatever. And, and I think what we ended up doing is we ended up all deriving equations separately ourselves. We came together and saw discrepancies, and then we did a spiral development on the equations, the Stockholm equations. But um, we're going to, my NDC wants to be able to analyze the data from the Spolex. I'm sure you do. So <laughs> the thing, the, so, uh, the thing is, if if we first could agree on uh, on methods, as as Romana said, if you can first agree on methods, and if if stuff that if you want me to remember the methods and we, we the region of interest and we do we do it in another way, you should 
we should better do it now than in six months. Absolutely. That's why the, the, there's a, there might be a huge time for, for, for community to review what was presented here or what was presented before. So that are we agree that we can perform like that or if someone has something else in idea uh, that we could check this or not. But we, if we, if we, if at the time we propose a tool, if, then uh, we don't want to run say that, but actually at the point we say that uh, we wanted other, other regions and stuff, we, we want to be able first all agree on what and how we do. Yes, and this is the, I think is the first uh, barrier that we need to overcome because the, all the other questions will have answer if you are able to review this data. So we need to have this ability. Mm -hmm. and then we can go one by one and we can mm -hmm. follow the process. But what do we do with this data if we don't know how to crunch them? So I would say that there are two main questions that need to be answered. One is the format, standardization of the, uh, the new IMS format on the noble gas. ROI definition, what? And, and this is a topic that should be very hot in the next month. And uh, also for Xero International, we still don't have a, a presentation, a more detailed presentation for Xero International on what is the impact of the new data. We, we don't know. We heard. But uh, well, when we, we, we decide a new standard which accommodates SPALAX, we need to consider also that is this standard accommodating also Xero International? Mix probably will talk very similar to sauna, but uh, this is the, the right moment to start defining a standard, and after that, or in parallel, the algorithm that has been proposed are agreeable. Can we can we use them for review, for um, accepting this, this data and start reviewing that? This is very important that in the, in the, within the next few months we decide that. And so. Do we have this will in the community, or is SEA driving solo and then we are set the final product as it is, and we have nothing to say anymore? Because of course they invest money. Software development will be money, and then we get the package which is completely not standardized. So in addition to the analysis tools, uh, wanting to have those before the one year, the other question is just what's the criteria for accepting the systems too? Kind of what else needs to be done within the one year of, is it a specific subset of measurements? Is it just running them in comparison? I think it'd be good to have things like that. Of we need to have analysis tools, we need to have X, Y, Z in place before we can accept silicon or a new. So what we did in the, in, in the, in the past generation, we let the system run for one year the target is the IMS target, 95% data availability in that requirement, which of course is a subset of requirement, it's not a station requirement, it's a system requirement. We have now, the, the, again, the, the labs that we should use it, and we may spike it uh, at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, just to see that uh, the performance doesn't change, that there is no problems in cross-contamination or whatever, like we are doing to the IMS station normally. So it's very much a uh, mim mimic of what we're doing on the, on the network. So but I have a recommendation. So we're not talking about uh, where we were in 2000. We're talking about recapitalization, essentially. Yes. I think we need some kind of So I think we need something that augments the certification requirements. And I don't know what we call it, a recapitalization document or something, but all these implicit things that we're talking about that are, are you know, what it would take to, to adopt Xenon International or the Spalix or the Mix or whatever, you know, it's more than just running one year, right? It's the software, it's et cetera. It's getting community agreement, all that kind of thing. I think a document needs to be written uh, I don't care what you call it, but it needs to be written, which is, these are all the things that we think, the community thinks needs to be done in order to recapitalize, recertify, re-whatever, this, this new phase of uh, noble gas technology. <laughs> Something like that. Who wants to help out in this document uh, drafting? Yeah. I'll help. Ted, you drafted, but someone has to review it. 
Not from the same country, please. No. <laughs> yeah, actually, they will. Okay, Justin, so maybe we, we will create a topic on the Inge and you can start uh, uploading the, first, the very first draft on this and then we will ask for comments on the community on this. Yeah, I think all the, deve I think all the developers are going to want to have input, right? I mean, that's yes. what happened before. Everyone's going to want to have their two cents, so I presume. But we need to start from now to look at this, what has been proposed today and uh, agree, comment, not agree, or whatever. This is needed, it's needed now. So do we have uh, volunteers to, to have that? And I'm talking about data format standardization. Also have a look on the proposal um, solution for a data transfer and the, cali the calibration and review algorithm that was proposed today. We need uh, at the next RNEC to come in August and say, okay, this was agreed. We can move on. Sorry, it won't be even. It won't be at the next RNIC. It'll be maybe, maybe in the one after that because the, the agenda is already set and it's. A no, 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 not day. to report to the RNIC, but to have it already uh, agreed in in the ing at that time time frame. I say in the next two months, can we have people looking at that and uh, because at the at the next uh, working group B, we we may reconvene for one hour and say okay, stamp, 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 or no. Anders. A few things, some things are easier to, to approve than others. I mean, for instance, the data format, that's nothing, I mean, well, to I, me at least. You think it's nothing, but, yeah. uh, right. <laughs> but it is not nothing. On the other hand, <laughs> an efficiency calibration method is very, very hard for someone who even don't have the detector itself and have been playing around with it to really check all the details. So Absolutely. We can, all we can say uh, is, oh, that looks okay. I agree. I, so. I agree. In fact, say I need to share a bit of some spectra. In this the, is needed. With, without that, we cannot do anything. In the, in the PowerPoint that was uploaded, uh, we, we upload the discussion that we had with, uh, with PTS in December and January regarding the, the standardization issue of the, of the detectors. Uh, we are really hoping that the, the simulated set will come back from MTL uh, pretty soon. And uh, regarding this thing, we, we said that we will follow precise schedules about documentation regarding the measurement that we will perform on this. And of course, at the point that we are agree with what we've measured and we have produced this docu documentation, we will, at the point, upload this to the, to the portal. If can make you more. So what is needed for us to, to comment on what has been proposed? Spectra? Spikes? And the description of the matter, is this enough? Should be enough. Okay, we, we should be reserving the, the new Sparax uh, by, uh, by mid-July at, uh, at CEA. We'll be very comfortable to do our own radioactivity measurement there during July and August. And uh, by, by this scheme, at a point, from our own process of validation of data, we will be able to provide this at this time, if it's validated. So who wants, who is volunteering and looking at this data? Where's the capability? Justin, FOI, Martin, of course, internally we will. <laughs> FOI, can you help us in that? Like I said uh, in the beginning, that I think maybe the result is the most important thing, actually. And uh, uh, of course, we can sit and, and look at the data, but I mean, for us, I think it would be enough to, if we have, could have this into comparison exercise instead. Uh, and okay, so, so you think that if you reanalyze the spectrum as being calculating concentration by a lab and this is congruent, then it's a sort of acceptance of the methods? Is this enough? 
I, I think we have to write this paper. Yes, yes. Which uh, is everything that's required. It may not be enough to say that it passed a calibration test, even if it is perfect, because NDCs will not be able to analyze that. Okay, so you know algorithm algorithms will be necessary, techniques, description of the physics, kind of like we started in the uh, noble gas handbook. If you remember that from long ago, we had something that described every single thing. We never finished that manual, but but we did get it down. It was always draft, but something like that. But I think this all belongs in in, in the document in this document that Justin said he would write, start on. Uh, but it would be nice to have it in stage. It would be nice to have it in stage because if you if you're thinking a big document, then we can wait forever. I mean, if we can start at yeah, we least the acceptance it, yeah. of the algorithm. Then we can probably draft it very quickly, and then uh, SEA can comply on this kind of, uh, which probably you already have everything already. So then we we ask some reviewer, but we need some voluntary reviewer of these methods uh, in the community. So I, I really would like to have one from FOI, Justin from PNNL, and uh, how about uh, England or other country that are willing to help? He was. Yeah, he left. <laughs> and we'll also be happy to look at uh, Xenon International data because actually we have not seen any procedure how the measurement is made. Is it different from what we proposed? Is it strongly different? And how, what's, how do you correct? What activity can you measure? Uh, in fact, how do you measure 131M? How do you measure 135? I in fact, uh, it would be nice that the next time we talk about Xenon International, but this is now the method. So th we are using this as a is a first uh, occasion to start putting this, uh, this down. And uh, what he's saying is exactly going to be applicable for all the others. But we need to agree on the, who is going to, who is willing to do that. So it will be only IDC, one FOI, and Justin. Is this the core or end? Germany's not here, but Germany has taken an active role in the past. Normally, and Canada is also. And Canada active. has, and China has, and Finland uh, to some degree. Um, so there have been a lot of groups that have so been very. We tell them in. that we are, that those are being I, appointed. I, I, I think we need to start with a draft document. Yes. And I, I, okay. I'm not really worried about timelines, although it is an important okay. issue. I don't know if we can answer that right now, and it does need to be done as soon as possible. But I think we need to talk about what the process is first. And then, then you're going to have to crack the whip from Vienna, probably, okay. for people to, to do it. The idea was to first show you that uh, we, we were advancing. We, we produce stuff. We, we are able to produce stuff. And we, we explain this to you. We are very open to communications as long as uh, we, we, we still have time for work. Yeah. That's not a problem for us. It's not a problem also to answer questions on the website if you have questions. On the limited extent, we prefer emails, but that's security issues. But uh, we, we, we also need time to be sure that our calibration method is good when we have it. Mm -hmm. And we also, before starting the one year process of sending data to, to, uh, to, uh, to the IDC, we will also have a few months of sending data to ourselves. And also those steps need to be validated internally before that we, we all. So there is documentation. You're free to look at this. You're free to communicate all together or directly to us. Uh, we are we have few people. You have you have our emails. Uh, we, we we can discuss. Okay, so let's conclude here. And uh, again, let me stress: uh, come to the Inge portal, the one that I didn't subscribe already received few emails now of a request of subscription. But be active there. Try to be active and uh, uh, request notification for the topic that you like. Also, the developers, not just uh, so also the, the industrializer, the the the, the commercial uh, party should be maybe more active there. Show that this this portal is really useful, and this is the really something that we need at this moment to share, because if we rely on uh, meeting every three months, we, we will not going too far. We really need to, do, to be virtual in this moment. 
Okay, so thank you very much for all. It'll be a very long meeting, but uh, hopefully.